I spy with my little eye, asthma, cancer, diabetes, stunted lungs. And it was a poor little thing, she could barely even say it. Hey everyone, before we get into the intersection of air pollution, health, climate inequality and cities, which I think you're going to love by the way, we wanted to share some exciting news. Climate Curious is going live this autumn, which means you'll be able to come join us face to face at live in-studio recordings in London starting in September. We'd love to meet you, so please grab your ticket using the link in the description and we'll see you there. We actually held our first ever live recording event this summer in partnership with our friends over at the US Embassy in London and The Conduit, which was so much fun. Let's get into it. We're so excited for part two for this conversation to be joined by Humphrey Miles. Um, You are the founder of the Central Office of Public Interest and you run national public awareness campaigns on issues that affect us all but that the government isn't focusing on. Um, Your first, we're going to talk a lot about one of your first campaigns, I'm not going to go into it, but you are a collective of creatives, I believe. Yeah, yeah, creatives, filmmakers, um, people who work in the creative industries generally. We, we're the people that make, you know, do the big campaigns for the big companies. So, so that's actually, yeah, that's my first question is tell us how you went from being a creative and working in all of these different kinds of areas to working on, I mean, in this case, air pollution. So I've been working in music and uh, film industry and, and various, you know, sort of creative uh, industries for like 20 years and kind of um, decided, well, we're the, we're the people that people, the, the big companies come to to like run big national campaigns they want to launch a new brand or you know raise their product awareness or whatever you know they buy a song from a musician and they shoot a big commercial which we do and then the ad guys come up with a big you know concept and it's like you know we can we can do that for stuff that affects us that we give a shit about that that the government is basically doing nothing about um because we're the people that make these campaigns so i'm like okay well let's let's you know, let's do this you know let's let's create a kind of alliance and just run big national campaigns on things that government has just not is not warning people about or telling people about or giving people data or information on. So, mm. so no, this is like a real passion project for you and everyone yeah. involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And we're actually going to do something we've not done before. We're going to do an interactive bit, right? Okay, great. What? So, um, I didn't know about this. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like you, I, and I'm actually going to do something which you're not normally allowed to do. I'm going to ask you to all take out your phones. I know, you get to use your phone. I have no idea what's going Don't on. Don't get distracted by any alerts. I haven't looked at mine. <laughs> Ignore but... the emails. Yeah. And do you talk them through? So, so yeah, so we, we just ran a campaign. Um, it's been actually like a three-year campaign, which first launched in London 2019, and then we relaunched nationally last year, and then just relaunched again with new data. It's been a real journey. Um, and we're going to talk about some of that data in a minute. We're going to well. talk about it again, yeah. But it's been like it's been like we've had billboards all over London saying things like location, location, lung disease, and whoa, um, whoa. we had like a, we had we ran a billboard campaign last year, like in every town and city across the UK, and it all focuses centres on the idea that we just want to give the public data because um, they're just not giving. It's it's, it's kind of like it's not being given to people, and mm. it's, air pollution is so complicated. There's so many mm. different pollutants and toxins and stuff going on. The, the, the atmosphere is like a kind of constant furnace of changing stuff going on. Um, and so, what we try to do is simplify it and just give it to people in a way that people can understand, and also in a way that's going to make people pay attention. And we decided to kind of use the property sector for that because when you start talking about the property market, suddenly people go, oh. You know, and like people who don't care about environmental issues necessarily, if you start saying, oh, air pollution is going to kind of impact the property sector, they go, oh, my God. You know, so and we're like, we're like so, this is something we should be so able to what we about. want you to yeah. do with these phones, because we're going to, we want to test it here, is we want you to go to, do you want to tell us the website that everyone's going yeah, to Yeah, yeah. So, so as I was saying, so the, the campaign focused on this um, website, which is a tool. It's a public service that gives people data. It's called addresspollution.org. So we're going to ask you to go to addresspollution.org. Yeah, so everyone get your phones out, go to addresspollution.org and then punch in your, your postcode, select your address and check out your air pollution rating. Whoa, and... I don't know if I'm down for this, man. Yeah. I don't yeah, know sorry. if I want to do that. <laughs> 
and don't shoot the messenger <laughs> because we're using we're using uh, we're using data from uh, from Imperial College London, which is the, the same data that government and Defra and City will use. Right? And who's shocked by what they're seeing? Yeah. Who's who's not shocked but not happy? Okay. Everyone's got address pollution dot org. Oh, so Type in just... your postcode, and it will tell you. This is absolutely devastating. I don't want it to be purple. Um, I could have dealt with red, but purple is way too far. So I'm, curi the... I'm curious. I want to know. Should can we do a little bit of a show? This is obviously if you're listening at home, please. I want you to do the same thing. I want you to go to address pollution dot org. Type in your postcode and see where you are. Obviously, it'll be diff wildly different because you'll be all over the UK. It'll be, you know, different ways. But for this room, I want to find out, like, how many people here are in, we say, what would you suspect? Above, let's say, how many people here are above the 90th percentile? Okay, that's almost Most there. people here live in London. <laughs> At least we're all in it together. And, and I'm curious, no. <laughs> Don't worry, it's going to be fine. <laughs> for the, oh for those God. of you not in the 90th percentile, how many of you live outside London? Oh, just a few. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, Judgment. I know. I see you, Disha, back there being like, huh. <laughs> um, this is shocking for people. Is that the reaction you get? Yeah, that and kind of annoyance and anger. How dare you tell me that my property is so polluted, like that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it's yeah. kind of, no, you're never going to get thanked by anyone for telling, for telling them about something. No, that Sorry, is, that's doing the, doing the middle hell. Sorry? <laughs> anger towards you. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's shocking. I mean, it's like, you know, air pollution is just shocking on so many levels. It's, that was the motivation behind why I set out to do this. It was like one of those things, the more you read and the more you learn and understand about air pollution and the absolute mountains of evidence of what it's doing to all of our health, but worse, the most vulnerable people, like kids, the elderly, um, the marginalized groups in society, it's, it becomes like you actually become furious about it. I did. I, I took like four weeks off work to research it. Tell us about make... that journey. I w I'm curious to know. I would love for you yeah. to talk us through that journey. Yeah, yeah. So I, I after work, you know, doing what I do, and I just decided I wanted to use my skill set for like, to, to kind of communicate this stuff to people. And this is 2016. So I took some time off work and I kind of plucked an issue out of the, out of the sky, not, not, not literally, but it was like either going to be climate change, which is just so systemic and complicated. And then I thought like air pollution is a much easier way of getting people to really care about that stuff because it affects us right now. It's kind of like a health issue. So I chose air pollution, took four weeks off work, started researching air pollution and check talking to all the experts talking to all the scientists learning as much as i could about it and it was just one of those things the more you just look under the bonnet and understand the science and the the, the medical science and the evidence of what it's doing even to unborn babies right you know in utero it's shocking and then you realize all then you start learning about all the potential solutions to pollution and that they're not being implemented or no, no one's doing anything about it literally mm. and it becomes like I mean, I mean, I'm quite an obsessive person anyway, but it's like, but you just become absolutely infuriated by it and kind of, that was my main motivation and then went on to form this, um, this group called Central Office of Public Interest and then we, we shot our first kind of public awareness commercial, which was like one of the old sort of government style ads which was, um, you know, starring my little girl, actually. It was a bit of nepotism there, but we couldn't, uh, couldn't actually... <laughs> <laughs> we, love, we love a little bit of yeah. nepotism. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was hard to do the kiddie casting, you know, when you didn't have any money. Um, but, um, and it was just a sort of standard thing of a little girl playing I Spy in the back of a car, and then, you know, it's like, you get to the, the last thing, and it's like, I Spy with my little eye, asthma, cancer, diabetes, oh stunted lungs. And it was... <laughs> poor little thing, she could barely even say it. <laughs> But, um, but it's, it's harrowing, but it was like, a, it kind of got a lot of attention and it made a big impact. And then we got a big ad agency involved to handle our account and it had a great creative team to come up with various ideas of how we could um, really push this to the, to the, to the next le you know, level, which was like run a major national public awareness campaign. Mm. And uh, we had loads and loads of ideas. There was like an augmented reality um, app, which, you know, was going to be cool. Or we're going to do something sort of a stunt in central London with the street lights, turn, change of color when the air pollution spiked, all this kind of stuff. And not, everything would have sounded cool. But then this idea of having a property rating for pollution came up. And it was like, oh, that's kind of boring. But then it was like, 
the more we thought about it, the more it became just genius because it's like the minute... There's a lot of people you can tell about the health impact and climate change and they do not care. Mm. But the minute you start talking about markets, financial markets and the property sector, mm. everyone's like, oh, my God, we need to do something about this. Yeah. And then it's like... And then, and then before you know it, you've got, then you've got the mortgage lenders caring about it. Yeah. So you've got the most influential sector in society. You've got the queen, you know, Buckingham Palace with a level of like 96. You've got, you know, all of central London, which has got the worst levels of pollution in the country, suddenly with the, with the worst pollution ratings um, in the property sector. And then we kind of, you know, there became an issue where we effectively changed the law on air pollution disclosure and... Um, and it's been, it's been a very effective campaign. I just, I want you to just explain that, the law change. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's, um, there's something called the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations. And this was something that we found, we started finding out about as the campaign was going on. We didn't know anything about this when we started out. Um, but basically, every agent is legally obliged to disclose every piece of information to a potential buyer that might affect their transactional decisions. Mm. So basically, if you, know that, if you know that there's like a really nasty neighbor or there's subsidence or you're on a floodplain or it's got rising damp, Japanese knotweed, asbestos, or anything, and you're selling the house as an agent and you don't tell them, you, are, you can be taken to court, sued, whatever. See, I okay? didn't know that. And I've it's material information. Now, so it, would be, yeah, so it would be a very, very, very difficult argument in court to argue that, that something that is going to potentially cause you long-term you know damage to your health potentially even kill your kid um or anyone is not material information so what we did is effectively by making the the data public it it made air pollution uh, a kind of material information it's like you know estate agents are obliged to give it to you and if they don't and the uh, solicitors are obliged to to tell you know potential buyers about it as well um so uh yeah okay all right I'm Christina Trouble. I'm the cultural attaché. I'm a career diplomat. Cultural attaché is just kind of a fancy way of saying that I promote sort of educational, cultural, civil society ties between the United States and the United Kingdom. And that's where the partnership with TEDx and Conduit has come in. This is our second in a series of conversations about climate and justice. Now, this issue tonight, when we were talking about all the things that we can talk about, why would Conduit, TEDx, and the U.S. Embassy want to talk about air pollution? I think in some places there are people who can avoid that conversation or they take for granted the air that we breathe and that's not always so easy and so really happy to be here with TEDx and with The Conduit to be hosting you all tonight and continuing this conversation and I look forward to many more. In the meanwhile, I remain climate curious. Uh, yeah, the other question I wanted to ask was you mentioned that everywhere in London is polluted and that yeah. the queen, the queen is a ninety-six, which I'm actually, I feel like a slight sense of vindication because <laughs> I'm just ninety-one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like, <laughs> for the difference of the properties, it seems fair. But um, <laughs> I'm just saying, um, yeah. Where, where are there areas in the city that are like the worst areas? Are there areas, or yeah. is it just across the board? It's all trash, and no matter where you live, like you're, you're done. No, I mean London. You know, there are areas. I mean, obviously, the roads have got higher concentrations in the, on the roads mm -hmm. because there's like NOx gases are higher. But there's a very, What's very a NOx gas, uh, like a derivative of nitrogen. So it's like NO2, nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen oxide. Okay. So, um, and um, but there's a, like a really very high ambient level of PM particulate matter, which is like the little particles, which vary in size, and the smaller they get, the more nasty they are. And the ones that get into your blood, through the your membrane, your lungs, they're the ones who mess with your body on a cellular level, like cancer. Mm. And it is. It's a cause of cancer. And I've done... What's, what's shocking, and what was another thing that, you know, motivated me, is that I did a whole load of, like, interviews with people in the street and interviewed, like, 10 people. So, like, you know... So, it, out of these, which ones are carcinogens, according to the World Health Organization? Asbestos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cigarette smoke? Yeah, of course. You know, air pollution? Nah. I know this is like mums oh, wow. pushing their babies with, on, you know, in prams along like four-lane motorways or four-lane A roads along the Malibu Road. P like, I spoke to guys working on roads. They don't know. Yeah. No one's told them that it's a carcinogen. I spoke, I did interviews with like, it's, it's so bad. And there seems to be an institutional 
resistance to telling the public about how bad air pollution is that mm. runs from the very top of government right down to local government, to companies, corporations, to employers, to everyone. Because the minute anyone tells the public how bad it is, right, they all become liable. Mm. Employers become liable for putting public, you know, putting their employers, you know, to work on the roads. The local councils become liable for housing, you know, their residents next to bloody, you know, to, to four-lane arterial routes or for putting school, building schools on the A40, which they are, or for having, I mean, the best one is, is Brent Cross um, uh, Beach, <laughs> which I saw the other day. I mean, I just, I looked at it and it's like, okay. Beach. Yeah, no, no, no. Right check, next check, to where all the is, highways come It's together. just, it's got to be the, the crappiest beach on the planet because <laughs> aside from being a Brent Cross, it's obviously in a car park. And there's I obviously do, really. not any sea there as well, which is never good for a beach. Um, but it's, it's on, sitting right on, 10 lanes of mm. some of the London's worst traffic. In fairness to so, Cross Beach, though, finding parking at the beach is usually quite difficult. So yeah. I well, that's like one good thing. Strategic, yeah. But still bad, still <laughs> yeah. bad. You're right. But you see, so we've now got a kid situation where we've got mums and dads actually bringing kids in to yeah. these places of high pollu of like toxic pollution uh to hang out for the day and like why are we not t why is no one being told about this i mean the world health organization has said these places aren't fit for habitation or for human they they you know they advise certain things based on human health the uk government as would rather we just got on with it and forgot all about it which is why we did why we ran this campaign why we're trying to trying to trying to do this one other question i yeah. have um is has anybody i don't know if anybody's seen mr robot anybody seen mr robot rami malik a couple of people shout out to you have you seen mr robot i haven't actually, okay no. all right you're Sorry. giving me like big elliot vibes which is like mr robot is like um <laughs> a, a hacker and he's like trying to overthrow the government i'm interested the only reason i bring it up is because i'm interested to know like what the the end game of the campaign was right because it because you said that nobody ever thanks you nobody ever thanks you for for sharing this information <laughs> yeah. i felt quite a lot of rage when i looked at the purple yeah. um and i'm i'm really interested in like what the what the steps beyond just making people aware of how bad the situation well, is are so it's so a public awareness by its very nature drives political change mm. it just does i mean it was um you, you know, you can't, you, the, if you want to change government, you have to change public opinion. I think that was Abraham Lincoln who said that. It's true. You want to just, and everyone in the lobbying industry knows that that's the case. You start, if you want to change government opinion on a certain, you know, new legislation that's coming, the first thing you do is you start with public opinion and you use the newspapers to lobby the, the hell out of people to get them on side. So just by the nature of driving public awareness, and you, you, you can change, you know, you change, you change government. So it's a, but it's a gradual thing. And when people, I'm a firm believer as well, and when people start understanding that a problem exists, people want to generally do something about it. And it's not an immediate thing. Like nothing about air pollution is going to be immediate. But we're not telling someone, we're not telling people about something that people can't do anything about. That's the, that's the thing, is that air pollution is not insurmountable. It's like something that we can all do something about when none of us are passive bystanders so the the, the the end game is is to drive change by by pushing public awareness and and driving the demand for action driving action and driving political action just via through through you know just with public public demand because this is one of those things where we we do have solutions oh yeah yeah you said oh my god before like endless and, and that, I think, is probably one of the, the most optimistic parts of this, right? Yeah, is that yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have the data now, which we yeah. didn't have in the past. I started out thinking it would be solved by now. <laughs> 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 so my little video, you know, we'd be what, solved in a few. From your perspective, if people are curious, like, what are some of the solutions that you've seen out there to this? I mean, we, you know, I mean, on so many levels, active travel. I mean, one of the main, the biggest solutions and the thing that really needs to happen is like major, major government investment in new infrastructure to just to, to, to end this car dependency that we have and to make people uh, getting, you know, make it easy for people to get around on either bike, train or walking um, and make, you know, streets safe, make them enjoyable to travel around. Um, but in terms of on the short term, just something like really small, like an idling ban, you know, an engine idling ban would, just, would, would bring down air pollution levels like significantly in, in, in you know, in urban areas. Um, 
but the, it's the main thing that needs to happen is we just need to get rid of cars in, in like but this that, that's not the only thing i mean jesus we've got so many sources of pollution there's like you know gas boilers agriculture is a major source of pollution which was something i didn't really know much about at all until i got really deep into this but it's like a really weird sort of toxic source of, of pollution because of all the ammonia and nitrates that are emitted from like things like herbicides and pesticides and animal waste and stuff like that um so yeah but there are yeah the main thing i think is just car dependency and more infrastructure in public transport i think it's got to happen which is yeah. i'm curious from your perspective which is this idea that you are obviously actively campaigning in this in this world uh, are an activist but you're using the tools from your trade yeah. as a creative. Yeah, yeah. And I want to just, just spend a few minutes just thinking about that for people who are listening, for people in the room who are like, well, I want to I wanna do something here with climate change, but I don't want to give, I don't want to become a full-time activist. Kind of how do you see that intersection being and, and, and for other people in the creative industries? Well, I mean, I think, I think every organization is effectively, I, the way I see these big companies and these big organizations is I always just look at them and go, these are just people. So like, let's say you work in banking, you know, you can start really questioning what your, you know, what the investments are that are being made and start talking about that vocally, you know, or you work in other, and I think it's, it's all... that's a, true for the creative industries too. Oh my God, like yeah. I mean, there's a big movement at the moment in the, in the advertising world to just end fossil fuel, you know, advertising. There's a huge thing in there to, like, you know, to, to stop advertising fossil fuels, um, which is really gaining traction. Um, Obviously, it hasn't Whether or not it's going to work, yet, I don't know. Because, I mean, you know, it's, it's, well, a, the way. But it's like they don't want to be doing that. They want to do something to change the world for the better and make the world better. And so it's actually been quite easy finding the resource, you know, to, to do this. Um, you know, people like to get paid as well, which we obviously haven't been able to do. But, um, but you know, this, this last campaign was pretty much done um, off the back of just a huge amount of voluntary work from a lot of people. I'm not talking like a small army of people. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. I think, I think, Ben, you're going to kick off this round of climate confessions. Okay, all right. Climate confessions. I don't know if I've got another one in me, to be honest. Um, climate confessions. What is my confession? So earlier we were talking about this, and I was going to say that I had a bath today and then I had a shower afterwards. Because I don't know if anybody else feels this, but when you have a bath, it feels like you're just sitting in a, like a pool of your own filth. Do you know what I mean? And it's not a very <laughs> pleasant feeling, so then you need to shower it off. But it was a cold shower, so that I think counts for something. But that's not my climate confession. That's just a, that's just more a little anecdote. Do you know what I mean? Just in case you're interested. Um, my climate confession is that I realised, like just before we started recording, um, that I have a really bad habit of when there are bathrooms that have towels paper towels I have this weird thing about like my hands feeling really dry um I feel like I, I can't do you know like when you were a kid if you used to go swimming um and then there were loads of kids that used to come out of the swimming pool with like wet socks and like just I can't do that kind of stuff like I can't have it needs to be wet or dry it's one or the other so I take what is I have now realized an excess amount of tissues. It's very, very unnecessary. And sometimes I take them and just scrunch them up and then dry them. So maybe it's only like two tissues that are actually being you know, used. There's actually a whole, a whole TED talk on how to dry your hands only using two I'm things. I'm not listening to that. Um, no, it, is it good? Yeah, it's good. I'm going to watch that. Um, so that's my climate confession that I've realized that I need to stop using um, as, mu as many paper towels as I do because it's, it's really... It's out of control, man. It's, it's going way too far. I don't know if that's a high bar or a low bar for you. <laughs> I mean, it seems pretty low impact, but... but All right, <laughs> Judge, judgmental. <laughs> My goodness. You're just trying to lower expectations no. or higher expectations. Uh, over to you. Uh, okay, my climate confession. Mine actually came up when we were discussing our next campaign, which is on climate change. And we were like, you know, we're going to solve climate change. We've got this great idea. And everyone was like, right, but what are we going to get people to do? You know, what's the action going to be? Every campaign has to have a call to action. And we're like, right, okay, do we get people to stop flying less? Or do we get people to insulate their home? And then someone in the room, they were like, no, I know. You know, the best, the most effective thing that we're going to do is go plant-based. You know, give up meat and dairy. And I was like, Ugh. 
<laughs> can we can we move on from that? Because <laughs> um, my kind of confession is, I, I love a sneaky burger. And I love, I, can't, I don't think I can actually think. I can't, I can't imagine life without meat or cheese. So I can see. It so I'm really, I'm really hoping. I'm really it's, hoping. It's a deep love. I'm really hoping that the, you know the, the, the sort of lab lab grown meat industry really takes off and we can continue this without too much guilt but I, it's I've going heard, to be a difficult one to give up i've heard this year in the u.s two to three years in europe for lab gun burgers i love beef burgers right thank you so much for your confession thank, <laughs> thank you, you ben thank, thank you. you i obviously also want to thank our partners uh the u.s embassy and the conduit for for making this possible and what was it what's the last thing ben oh remember stay curious Thank you so much for joining us this week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate, subscribe and share this episode with a curious friend. It makes us possible to keep making this amazing content for you. Oh, and slide into our DMs at TEDx London and let us know which climate extraordinaires you'd love to hear from next time. But wait, that is not all. No, this podcast was produced by the amazing Josie Coulter. Curation and research by the genius Tara Cooper. Artwork designed by the visionaries that are Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Mixed and engineered by the iconic Ben Beheshti, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also composed our banging theme tune. Presented by me, Marion Pasha. And by me, Ben Hurst. Stay curious. Stay curious.